Well, welcome back to our uh, uh, topic on statistics and our math proficiency review. This is from the Data Analysis Problem Stats. Statistics are basically a study of data, all right? And one of the basic uh, components of statistics are the measures of central tendency. There are three of them. We're going to start with mean, which is just the fancy name for the word average. And you guys have been doing averages since uh, grade school because you just add up how many items of data there are and then you divide by the number of items of data. So if I'm adding five people's ages, I add them up and I divide by five to find the average age. Now they're not always that easy. In fact, here's a couple of examples of problems that have to do with averages, but there's a twist to them, as most of the problems in the proficiency have. Uh, first example, Nicholas bought five work shirts for $100, excluding tax. He also bought a sweatshirt. The average price for all six shirts was $19.25. What was the price of the sweatshirt? Well, the idea is that if we have five work shirts for $100, they're going at about $20 a shot here. 100 divided by 5. But the price of all six shirts, uh, the average price here is $19.25. So the sweatshirt was actually cheaper than $20. So we know right away it can't be answer D. It's got to be one of these right in here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the average price of $19.25 and I'm going to multiply it by 6. That's 0 carry a 3, that's 12 and 3 is 15 carry a 1. That's 54 and 1 is 55, carry a 5, that's 6, that's 11, with two decimal places. And as you can see, all six shirts total $115.50. If I subtract the $100 that the first five shirts cost, the difference here of $15.50 would be the price of that sixth shirt, which was the sweatshirt, and that's answer A. All right, another problem that has to do with averages but has a little bit of a twist to it. Uh, it would be like this. It says if Jim has the following scores for his test, and his test scores are 87, 84, 93, and 90, what does he need to get on his fifth test to have an average of 90%? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to, there, there's a way to do this algebraically, and there's a little shorter way, and hopefully it will seem logical to you, and I'm going to go ahead, clear out a little space right here, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this without a lot of algebra. I'm going to take each of the test scores, the first four test scores, I'm going to write them down here, and then I'm also going to leave a space for the fifth score. Maybe clear a little bit more of this out. Okay, so we want to average a 90. Well, what happens is some of the scores are below the average and some of the scores are above the average and they have a tendency to balance one another out. So I look to see how much below and how much above the averages they are. For example, the average is 90, this is an 87, this is 3 below, so I'm going to put a negative 3. This is 84, so this is 6 below the average, I'm going to put a negative 6. This is 93, this is actually 3 above the average, so I'm going to put a plus 3. And this is right on the, the average here, so that's a zero. That doesn't help or hurt. That's the average. Now, this has to balance out, so this has to add up to zero. Well, it clearly doesn't add up to zero. These two do. I could kind of cancel those two out, but overall, I am six below the average, which means that this last test has to be six above the average for it to balance. Well, the average is 90. Six above the average would be 96, and that is answer B. The uh, second measure of uh, central tendency is what we call the median. Now, we know what a median is in the road. It's that raised uh, concrete section that's in the middle of the road. Well, that's kind of how we can remember what the median is for uh, statistics. Uh, it's the middle number in a data set. So if we have a set of numbers, it's the number in the middle, but only after you put the numbers in order. You arrange them in order from least to greatest, smallest to largest, or the other way around. It can be the other way around. Most times it's smallest to largest. Now you're wondering, well, what happens if you have, instead of just one number in the middle, if there are two numbers in the middle, you have an even number of data. Well, then you average the two numbers in the middle if there's an even number of data. So you still put them in order, you find the two that are in the middle, add them together, divide by two. That's what I mean by average. You find the mean of them. Here's an example of a problem, and again, chances are the problems are not going to just ask you to find the mean or the median, but it's probably part of the problem somehow hidden in it. 
Um, problem, uh, first example, Mrs. Perez said that half of her employees earn more than $28,000 per year and the other half earn less. What statistical measure did she use to reach her conclusion? Well, if half are above and half are below, she's got the one in the middle. So just like you would think, it would be the median. Okay? Now, we know what the mean is. That's when you average them. Sometimes the average, the mean, and the median are turn out to be the same number, but not always. If you're wondering what a mode is, we're going to talk about that next. And the range we've talked about in a previous video, it's the largest value minus the smallest value. But I'm not going to tell you quite what a mode is yet because I'm going to get to that in just a minute. The next example, if students are lined up by height, which central tendency would be the student in the middle of the line? Again, if they're lined up by height from uh, tallest to shortest or shortest to tallest, the one in the middle is the one that's right smack dab, that would be the median. Again, not only is it the same answer, it's the same letter, answer B, the median. So both of these are a little bit more direct. They don't actually have you find the median, but you have to know what the idea is of the median. Now, we talked about a box and whisker plot in one of the other videos uh, when we were going over some of the uh, graphs and such uh, back in uh, the data analysis part. So we've already had this, if you've been watching the videos in order. If you haven't, uh, a box and whisker breaks up a data set into fourths. Uh, you can see this is a fourth, this is a fourth, this is a fourth, and this is a fourth. Not by length, but by the number of data pieces that are in each of those interval values. One-fourth of the data is between 61 and 70. One-fourth of the data is between 70 and 82. One-fourth of the data is between 82 and 88. And the other fourth, the last fourth of the data, between 88 and 100. Well, that means half the data is to the right of 82, half the data is to the left of 82. My answer is 82. This is the box right in here. The line that goes up and down here in the box is the median. Okay, and remember, uh, this value on this end and this value on this end, if we subtract them, 88 minus 70. I talked about this before. This is the interquartile range, or the IQR. The actual range would be 100 minus 61, as the ends of the whiskers give us our largest values and smallest values. Our third measure of central tendency, and our last measure of central tendency, is the mode. All right, the mode is the item <coughs> that occurs most frequently in a set of data. You can have more than one mode, because you might have a tie, there might be a set of data where you have a lot of numbers repeated, you might have two or three that are repeated the most, and there could be a tie. So you can have more than one mode, and you can also have no mode. If none of the numbers are repeated, for example, if I had a list of everybody's social security number, uh, they would all be different and none of the numbers would be repeated, so then we say there is no mode. Okay. Now let's look at this first example. It says, after recording the racing times of her swim team, the coach calculated that the racing time that occurred most often. What statistical measure did she calculate? So she looks up, she's got this set of times, she figures out which one it is that occurs most often. Well, occurs most often, that's what I was just talking about, that would be answer C, which would be the mode. Okay? I wish all the problems were that easy, but uh, more than likely we'll be very blessed if we have one of those that are that simple. Next one up. Use the set of numbers below, 5, 5, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, 17, 30, and 40. Which of the following numbers, when included in the set, would change the mean, but not the median or the mode? Well, to find the mean, first off, there are 10 numbers. If you add them all together, you get 144. So if you divide 144 by 10, the mean, 144 by 10, is 14.4. So any of these choices down here is going to change the mean because the only one that wouldn't is if I had one of the choices be the mean itself. So what we want to do is we want to see do any of these ones change the mean but not the median or the mode. Now first off, the mode is 5 because it's the one that occurs twice. No other number occurs more than one time. The median since there is an even number of data, you take the 2 in the middle, 9 and 11, and you average them, and that's a 10. See, if I bring a 5 in, a 5 as an extra set, that's not going to change the mode. That's going to keep the mode the same, but what's going to happen, oh, I skipped one, but what's going to happen here is I'm going to change how many bits of data I have, and that's going to make me have 11 pieces of data, and then the middle number is going to be the 9, and that's going to change the median. Same thing with the zero. If I bring a zero, I put it here, and it's not going to change the mode. I'm still going to have a five, but it's going to change the median. 
Now, on the other hand, if I bring in the 10, the 10 would go right here. And the 10 is already the median, and now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it would be the middle number, so that wouldn't change. I'm pretty sure my answer is C. I'll double check here just in case 15, let me erase this. If I bring 15 in, 15 would go in over here, then I would have 11 as my set, my, uh, my median now. Uh, the mode would have stayed the same, but it would have changed the median. So it can't be A, B, or D. It's got to be answer C. The last example here I have, even though it's not multiple choice, I just wanted to show you that sometimes when you're using like a stem and leaf plot, which we talked about in a previous video, you can identify the mode almost immediately because what you do is you'll check each of the stems and then you'll look for that stem, look at the leaves and see if any of the leaves are repeated. Like here, the two is repeated, but down here the three is three times. I have three 33's and that's the most so I can just look at that and I can identify the mode. If I take one of the threes off, let's say, just just to see, then I have two 22's and I have two 33's. Then I would have two modes because they would occur, it would be a tie, they would occur both twice and my modes would be 22 and 33. Okay, a little different than measures of central tendency are the measures of variation. And the one that we look at is the range, and you've seen this before. Now this also has a, a meaning in algebra having to do with functions, but this is a different meaning here. The range of a set of data is the highest value of the data set minus the smallest value of the data set, the largest minus the smallest. Okay, so let's see if we can use that information to answer a problem or two here. Let's start with this one. The low score on a test is 62. If the median score is 75, the mode is 72, and the range is 23, what was the high score? Now this is a really good problem for a couple of reasons. First off, to, to actually solve it isn't that bad, but it also gives a good example of a problem where they throw in extra information that's not necessary, extraneous information, distractors, things to kind of throw you off your game here because you've got all these numbers you think, well how am I finding my value here when I have all these numbers? Well we don't need the median score and we don't need the mode score. But we do need to know that the fact that the low score was 62 and that the range was 23. Remember, the range is the highest value minus the smallest value. The highest value minus the smallest value, or the lowest value, is equal to 23 here. And I know that the lowest value is 62. So what I have here is a little equation. I'm going to add 62 to both sides. And I get 85. And that's answer B. The next example uses a, a, a line graph that I've drawn out down here. It says the graph below shows the price of one pound of a certain type of metal. Uh, the points on the graph represent the price of the metal on the first day of each month. So first month, second month, third month, all the way to the twelfth month. So it's over a year. You'll notice this little squiggly right there and that means that it goes from zero up to ninety and this is to represent that we kind of skipped all the numbers in between and jumped right to 90 where all the actions at, all the way up to 230 here. These are the prices, and I'm assuming that's in dollars. Now, the question says, uh, based on the graph, what is the, uh, the range of the price, uh, the prices of the metal? So the range of the prices is the highest value minus the smallest value. Well, just on observation, this gives me the highest and this gives me the lowest there. The highest value appears to be $1.70. And the lowest value is $1.10. So that gives me 60 cents for my range, and hopefully that's a choice it is. It's answer B. Okay, let's do something a little different here. Let's talk about sampling. Now, this being an election year, there are all sorts of polls that are going on, and you can watch them on TV and find out who's voting for who. So we're going to do... There, they're in the process of doing sampling. What they do is they survey a small group to determine the opinion of a larger group. If they want to know who's going to vote for, let's say, the President of the United States, well, you would have to check with every person in the United States. So that's too difficult to do. There's millions and millions and millions of people. So instead, what they're going to do is they're going to pick a smaller group of people and they're going to try to make the sample without bias. They're going to try to make it random. They're going to try to make it a large enough sample that it'll have um, meaning to it. 
uh, meaning to what the, what the results turn out to be. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about sampling and some of the key ideas here. First example, to determine what type of music people in a city listen to most often, employees at a radio station polled each person who entered a grocery store between 2 and 5 in the afternoon on Sunday. Which term best describes the people who were polled at the, at the store? Well, it's not a test. A census has to do with determining the population, not necessarily determining uh, what type of music they listen to, and the statistic is not going to be representing those people that are pulled from the store. It's going to be a sample. Okay? A smaller group picked to determine uh, the opinion of a larger group. Uh, that's, I know that's a really basic definition, but that'll, that'll work for the proficiency test. Next one up. A high school principal wants to determine the average amount of time that all students at the high school spend riding school buses each day. Which group of students could be surveyed to get the least biased sample? So we want it so that it's, it's not um, uh, thought of in just one way because of a belief of a certain uh, group of people and such. We want it to be as general and as random as possible. So in this case, we're trying to find out information about what? About how much time people, uh, the kids spend on the school buses each day. All right. So if we're going to try to find out about how many uh, hours or how many minutes are spent each day for students on a school bus, a high school school bus, then what we want to do is we wouldn't want to talk to people that weren't experiencing that. We would want to talk to high school people that were riding buses. So let's see what we have. Students at the bike rack in the afternoon. Not a good group. Because chances are if they're at the bike rack in the afternoon, it's because they're getting their bike and they're, and they're riding their bike home. So they're not taking the bus, so they won't have that information. That's not a good one. I'm going to cross that one right off the list here. Uh, B, students who do not have a driver's license. Now that would be better than the bike rack because if you don't have a driver's license, then chances are you have to depend on a different mode of transportation. But it could be parents driving them to school, they could be taking the bus, they could be walking, they might be getting there, uh, you know, other ways than riding the school bus. So I don't think this is going to be it. It's better than this one, but I don't think this one's going to be it. C, students uh, on every sixth bus that arrives at school. Well, the nice thing about every sixth bus is because uh, if, you, if you just took the first bus, they're probably all coming from the same area of town, and they're probably getting there in the same amount of time, so they would all have the same number, the same number of minutes, same number of hours, whatever it might be. But every six bus means you could be getting people from all around uh, the school, not from just one neighborhood perhaps. And so you would have different times. And this probably is my best bet. I, I just want to check out D. Students in one social studies class from each grade. No, that's not going to do it. Because again, same problem as students that don't have a driver's license. We don't know if they're taking the bus. Our best answer here is C. All right, next example. A person is seven feet tall. In which group is the person's height not likely an outlier, I'm going to underline that, when compared to the heights of all the other people in the group? Now, this is an easy problem to answer if you know what the word outlier means. When you have a set of data, if all the numbers are bunched together, but you have one number that's really too big or one number that's really much smaller, those are called outliers. So in this case, because he's so tall, we want to make sure that we pick a group of people in which his height doesn't put him way taller than everybody else. So let's see, is it Group A, a Girl Scout troop? No, no. They're too small, they're too short, uh, they're young, so they're not going to be very tall. You'd be lucky to get people over four foot tall there. Uh, men's professional basketball team, that looks pretty good because if they're playing in the pros, they're all pretty tall. Uh, I'm going to keep that one right now. I'm just going to check the other two. A middle school math class, no. Again, too young, too short. And a, girls, a women's gymnastic team, too short. So it's going to be answer B there, and I'll circle that. Okay, um, throughout the test, you're going to probably have information given to you in a, in a table. And this is not necessarily the pure statistical problem, but I just wanted to bring one up here before I ended the section. Uh, read the table carefully. I usually, when I see a table, before I even read the problem, I read the table to kind of get the information from it. Like, in this case, it's a repair company charges. Number of hours to complete a job, total amount charged per do, uh, in dollars, uh, three hours, it's 195, five, it's 275, 12, it's 555, 16, it's 715, and it's a little close to the bottom of the screen, but hopefully you can read this. For 19 hours, it's 835. Now, most companies, 
when they repair something, they charge per hour. But a lot of times there's an upfront fee, uh, maybe just to show up at your door before they start doing the repairs or something along those lines. It depends on you know, the company. So there may be like uh, an initial charge and then so much per hour. So let me go see what happens here. The table below shows the uh, total amount of repair company charges for five different jobs based on the number of hours each job takes to complete. The relationship between the number of hours a job takes to complete and the total amount that the company charges continues, I guess it follows this pattern. Which is the least number of hours that the company would take to complete a job and charge a total amount that is greater than $5,000? Well, I need to do this problem in such a way that I can get an idea of is there an upfront charge and so on. Now this requires probably more math in some ways than we've looked at in a lot of problems. I don't know if there's a really fast way to do this other than the fact that you could just you do some uh, a pattern here and do some random guessing. But since we've got to get up to $5,000, that's a pretty good jump. Now, one thing you could look at is say, well, this is 555. What if I multiply this by 10? Then this would be 10 times as much. And so that would be over 5,000 times 10 is 24. Um, I don't know. It doesn't look like that's going to that's gonna follow suit very well because there's that initial fee and we don't know how much all that is and that's affecting the overall cost. So I think what I'm going to have to do here is I'm going to have to do it kind of a long way. I'm going to, I'm going to let x be the number of hours and for this case, or the, the cost per hour I should say, x is the cost per hour. And so this would be 3x and then let's say there's an initial fee of y dollars and it costs 195. All right, uh, for five hours, that's five times x plus y, and that costs 275. Let's see what I get out of here. Well, I'm going to negate the top, and I'm going to add them straight down, and I'm going to get 2x is equal to 85, no, 80. So x would be 40, so that's $40 an hour. And then y is the upfront fee, so if I plug 40 in here, I get 200 plus y equals 275. So if I subtract 200, I get 75. That's a tough problem. So the upfront fee is $75 just to show up, $75 and then $40 an hour. So if I need $5,000 here, I'm going to subtract 75. That gives me 4,925. And now I'm going to divide 4,925 by 40. Now it's not going to come out exact because this is a rough amount here. We want to make sure that it's greater than $5,000. We'll find it exactly and then we'll just bump it up a little bit. So in this case, let me get rid of this, 40 goes in that once, that's 40, that's 92, goes in that twice, that's 80, that's 12, and a 5, and it goes in that three times with a little bit left over. So the little bit left over means I bump it up to the next hour and you can see that it is 124 hours. Now this, for someone that hasn't had a lot of algebra, is a tough problem. So what you would have to do here sometimes is see if you can maybe take whatever you can from the problem and try to eliminate one or two answers if you can. It would be tough on this, but if nothing else, you take an educated guess. You take a guess and you say, I hope that this is going to do it because it's a one out of four chance. If you leave it blank, there's no way you're going to get that problem right. So that kind of leads us, uh, finishes things up here and gets me to the end of things. Hopefully you've watched the videos. I know they're time consuming, but at the same time, they're a good review of all the things that you need to know to pass that proficiency test because you don't want to take this lightly. It's important that you pass that test so that you can go on and get the, you know, the requirements for your diploma. You know, don't let it just slide by. Don't think, well, I'm a sophomore. I'll take it next year. I'm not going to worry about it. Worry about it. Study. Practice these problems. Go www.succeedinmath.com. Practice problems there. Go through these videos and really make sure that you understand them. Talk to your math teachers. Do not be passive about this. You want to pass this test. You want to get it out of the way. Be aggressive. Study. Study as much as, uh, as you have the time for. Ask lots of questions. Now, uh, before I forget, one more, one more problem. 5Q plus 5Q. Well, that's an easy one compared to the one we just did. That's 10Q. And the reason I bring that up is because... 10Q makes me think that I want to thank a number of people. I want to thank Mr. Barnett who uh, helped me out with picking some problems and gave me a lot of pointers on tips and strategies and such. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Ladwick who is 
uh, responsible for doing all the technical work as far as uh, getting us on the website. I want to thank our administration, um, Mr. Carter, Ms. Gilmore, because it was them. Uh, it was through them that uh, this became possible. I want to thank Mr. Um, Blobaum, uh, who gave me the idea for the initial dragnet uh, introduction at the very beginning. And most of all, I want to thank my grandson, Aiden, uh, because he just took his CRTs in third grade. And I can see how important it is for students to be prepared to take these standardized tests. And so hopefully this will help you to pass the math proficiency test. Good luck now.